for joining us online. Here at the house, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. If you have a testimony, please send it to amen at hotl.church. If House of the Lord has impacted you in any way and you'd like to partner with us financially, please visit our website, hotl.church, and click the top right. Or you can text the dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the message and have a great day. We've been in a series in the book of Romans, and I'm super excited to continue it today. Um, I just want to honor our lead pastor, Pastor Jeff, um, for opening it. The first two weeks, it was so good, wasn't it? And I remember we had a Pastor Nate, um, all the way from Montana, speak last week, but, but those two words Pastor Jeff gave, um, you know, just to remind you, Romans is a tough book, um, but there's also some really good news in Romans, um, and, and I'm excited to get into, to get into some good news today. Um, you know, Pastor Jeff, he just gave you bad news, but I'm, I'm here to give you some good news. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm excited. Um, yeah, and if you didn't hear, I got to give a shameless plug. This week uh, is our fireworks stand. And so starting this Wednesday, you can come and buy explosives at noon, okay? Um, and it, for the first time ever, it, it's going to support our youth ministry, but it's also going to support our young adults ministry, um, which is, it's awesome. It's awesome um, what God is doing in this house. So I think with that, we'll get into it. I, I want to just kind of, we're, we're going to be in Romans chapter 3 today. I don't want to read it just yet. Give me a second. But, but I want to, if I, if, I could, if I could summarize Romans chapter 2, um, I would summarize it as this, that rescue will not happen by trying to obey the laws of the Torah, by the laws of the Old Testament. And we're going we're gonna to start in Romans 3. We'll kind of go backwards to Romans 2 for a little bit. Um, but really, I want to I be in Romans 3 because Romans 3 is really that God's righteousness has rescued us through Jesus. And the fact that we got one amen means that we need this sermon. Okay. God's righteousness has rescued us through Jesus. I, uh, I haven't preached on this stage in about six months. I've been preaching downstairs in the, in the multi-purpose room. And if you ever spoken in that room, it's very echoey. And so I've been preaching for the last six months really quiet. So one of two things are going to happen today. I'm going to be really quiet and calm and reserved, or I'm going to go crazy. Okay, so just bear with me. We got earplugs in the back. No, I, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it good. But I want to read God's Word. Would you go to God's Word with me? Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 21. And if you don't have a Bible, it'll be on the screen for you. Um, and this is what... Paul says in Romans chapter 3, he says this, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as promised in the writings of Moses and all the coughs in the room and the prophets long ago. I'm a really unprofessional preacher, okay? I'm just, we're going to have fun up here. So just, just everybody relax a little bit. All right. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone, somebody say everyone, who believes no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short, short of God's glorious standard, yet God with undeserved kindness. He declares that we are righteous. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. And this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times. Last verse, for he was looking ahead and including them. Come on, somebody say, I'm thankful. Come on, God looked ahead and he saw you and he saw me and he saw your kids and he saw your grandkids and he saw your great grandkids and he said, I'm including them. God did this. Let me read that again. He was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Amen. We could read that, pray, and go home, and it'd be a good sermon. Amen? Amen. 
Pray with me this morning as we, as, we, as we continue. Jesus, we thank you that you're already here. I thank you that you're filling us up. God, I thank you that you're in us for us. God, you're on us for other people. I pray, Holy Spirit, this morning, you would just help me so communicate this, this message with grace, God, with truth. And God, I pray truly that there would be an exchange that happened today. God, that we would exchange our brokenness, God, for your wholeness. God, that we would exchange our, our, our mess for your healing this morning, Jesus. That we would come and exchange our guilt, God, and, 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 and God, all the things that we carry for your righteousness this morning, Jesus. I thank you that you've declared us righteous. And God, no word goes above yours. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. 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 If you're taking notes today... Um, I want to title the, this message, I want to title this message that freedom is our testimony. Freedom is our testimony. I love a good testimony. Anybody love a good testimony? Last week, if you were here, we had men from Men's Summit that got to get on the stage and, and they get to testify about what God did in their lives at Men's Summit. And testimonies are powerful. You know, one, one, of the, one of my favorite verses in the Bible about testimonies is, come on, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's, it's, it's a way we fight against not flesh and blood, but, but, but spirits and Satan and, 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 and the powers of this dark age. We get to stand and we get to testify what God has done in our life. And here at the house, we love testimonies. I don't know if you've noticed, but every time we do like an event, we're like, let's make some time for testimonies. We love testimonies for a lot of reasons, but one reason we love testimonies is because they are representative of lives, lives that have been changed by the love of Jesus, lives that have been changed by community. Come on, people who, who, who were helpless but found hope in Jesus. People who were jaded, who were hurt, who were angry, but they found faith again in Jesus. People who walked away from Jesus, but by his grace, they stepped back into relationship with Jesus and they found his goodness again and they found his faithfulness again. They came and they tasted and they saw that the Lord is good. Come on, somebody. We love testimonies. Young people. Coming through those doors every Wednesday, coming into house youth, discovering their identity in Jesus, discovering friendship, discovering community, discovering their own faith, not their parents' faith, not their pastor's faith, but their own faith. People who, who are lonely coming through these doors, not knowing the community that awaits them, but before they leave, they are assured, I no longer have to walk alone. Amen. People who have sickness in their body, people who have pain in their body. But one moment with the, with the great physician, they can be healed. And all of these testimonies that we tell, they, 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 they're only possible because the price Jesus paid 2,000 years ago. Come on, is anybody thankful today for the blood of Jesus that gives us a new beginning? It's Him. This is what I love about testimonies, is it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with God. I don't stand up here and be like, let me tell you all the things I did. No, no, no. I get up here and my job in a testimony is let me tell you how much I messed up and how good God is and how he put my mess back together. Come on, I'm just Humpty Dumpty. I fell off the wall and he just keeps putting me back together. It's God. It's his story. Every testimony we tell has nothing to do with you, has everything to do with God. It's his blood. It's his sacrifice. It's the price that he paid. It's the fact that he's so good. It's the fact that he doesn't have to help you, but he chooses to. It's the fact that he doesn't have to love you, but he chooses to. And all of our freedom, it stands on the foundation of what Jesus did for us. I love 1 Peter. 1 Peter, he'll write that, that Christ is the cornerstone. That we, we are to build our lives on Jesus. Listen, you don't build Jesus on your life. You build your life on Jesus. We have too many people trying to build Jesus onto their life. Now we got to get rid of our life and start over. We need to be, begin to build again on the foundation of Jesus. I want to read again Romans 3, but just 21 through 24. But I want to read it in the Passion Translation because I just think it's beautiful. If you don't like the Passion Translation, email Pastor Jeff. I don't know what else to say. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Please don't. Please don't do that. 
email me, I'll take it, I'll, I'll talk with you. I love the Passion Translation, it's really good, but just listen to how, 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 how it's written in the Passion Translation. But now, independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the Anointed One. This is the righteousness that the Scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him receive that gift. For there is really no difference between us, for we all have sinned and are in need of the glory of God. And yet, through his powerful declaration of acquittal, listen to this, God freely gives away his righteousness. You know, some we say all the time, it's kind of becoming white noise, is you can't earn God's righteousness. Can we be a church that knows that we, we serve a God who freely gives? He freely gives His righteousness away. And I love this so much. His gift of love and favor now cascade over us. All because Jesus, the Anointed One, has liberated us from the guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin. The guilt, the punishment, and the power of sin. How did Jesus change our story? He took our guilt... He took our punishment, and He took the power of sin. And because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, He eliminated the power of sin from our lives once and for all. You know, I love watching the NBA playoffs. Crazy transition. That was awesome. Um, I, 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 it's so funny. I won't watch one single NBA game throughout the year. But when the NBA playoffs start, I watch all the games. My wife loves it. We, <laughs> we, were, we, went, we just recently uh, had the privilege of, of getting to go to Mexico for, for vacation um, for a week. We were celebrating Lisa's 30th birthday, my wife, my beautiful wife. She's turning 30 in a, in a couple weeks. We went early. Um, and also, she's really smart and funny. I was supposed to say that. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I love you. And like, I, I, we, it was during the finals, the, the NBA finals, and, and I was so desperate to watch that I like turned on the, you know, the Mexican TV and I watched it in Spanish. I was like, I don't even care. Basketball is basketball. I'm going to watch this. Let's go. Let's go. And, and the Nuggets won and, and it, we had a 20 piece nugget. And I'm just kidding. What am I even talking about? I love, I just, I love the NBA playoffs, and, and I, about at halftime, I discovered that there was an English channel, and I was like, there is a God, right? And I put the English on. It was much better, but I was so desperate to watch. I even watched it in Spanish, and, um, but there's just something about the, the, the playoffs. Like, like, anybody like March Madness? You, some of you are like, what? March Madness? Some of you don't even watch college basketball, but when March Madness starts, you watch March Madness because there's something on the line, right? If you lose, you're out. If you lose, you're done. We love watching like the, the Cinderella story. We love watching the underdog beat the big team. And I, and I love the playoffs. One of my favorite things to do in the playoffs, especially when the team that I wanted to lose loses. I love going on Instagram and going to ESPN's account and they post like the best player's face and over the face it just says eliminated. And I'm like, yes, eliminated. And if Pastor Joel were here, we would pray for him because his Warriors got eliminated. You can't win every year, Steph Curry. Um, but I love, when, when a team gets eliminated, nobody's thinking to themselves, hey, when do they play again? Right? Did it Monday, Tuesday? Wait, wait what? No, they're, they're, they're done. They're, they're eliminated. They don't get to play anymore. Right? But yet sometimes, somehow we read the scripture that tells us that guilt and punishment and the power of sin have been eliminated, yet we still wonder if it's going to show back up in our lives. But I came to tell some people today that guilt is gone. Come on, punishment is gone. The power of sin has been broken once and for all. It is finished. Come on, is anybody thankful that God took the guilt, he took the punishment, and he broke the power of sin once and for all? The question today is, do you actually believe that? Or is that just Bible, you know, just words? Is that just the things we say in church? Or do we actually live our lives believing that? That the, that, that the guilt is gone. That punishment is gone. That the power of sin has been broken once and for all because of the blood of Jesus. 
Do you know the power that has been given to you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Do you know the bad news that precedes the good news? Because can I tell you something, friend? Your, 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 your testimony of freedom without the price that Jesus paid is not a testimony of freedom at all. It's a testimony of bondage. It's a testimony of despair. It's a testimony of darkness. It's a testimony of pain. It's a testimony of brokenness. It's a testimony of disillusionment. But because the price Jesus paid 2,000 years ago, you and I can walk in freedom. You and I can walk in the destiny that he gave to us. Which brings me to my first point today. We're jumping right in. And that is this. He took the guilt. He took the guilt. Come on, tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, he took the guilt. Come on. Help me out today. This, this, will be, this is really simple, and then we're going to go deeper and deeper. Is that cool? He took the guilt. Listen, guilt is so destructive. All of us in this room, we, we, we know what it's like to feel guilty, don't we? Right? We've all said something we didn't want to say. We, we've all done something we ended up regretting. We've all been a part of a situation that, may, that left us feeling ashamed. Guilt marks our life, not just psychologically, but even physically. Did you know that guilt actually affects you physically? That guilt can make you ill. It can make you sick. It can give you migraines. It can actually leave pain and aches in your body. Now, there's importance in seeing the difference between guilt and shame. See, guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am bad. But you need to understand that when we hold on to guilt, when we don't release guilt, when we don't give our guilt to Jesus, we eventually go from, I did something bad, to I am bad. And we have people because they don't release their guilt to Jesus because, because we don't actually believe that God wants our guilt we believe that in our guilt, God is pushed away, but in reality, in our guilt, God draws near. Can I tell you, in your pain and in your brokenness, God draws closer to you. But if we're not careful and we hold on to it and we shove it down and we try to deal with it in our own strength, eventually, 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 it goes from I did something bad to I am something bad. And it becomes identity. Guilt is a, is a heaviness that none of us were meant to carry through life. Guilt, it torments us and it haunts us and it isolates us and it makes us feel stuck in life. We can't, we, we can't look forward into what's ahead of us because we're too busy being pulled into the past and what happened in our past. We can't focus on what God has set before us because we're too busy being pulled into the past. And one of the reasons that we don't come to God in our guilt is because we believe God is angry with us. We, we, we don't approach the throne of grace with boldness because, well, we're full of guilt and shame, aren't we? And even if we do come to God, we don't actually believe He wants us there. I love this quote by Marjorie Thompson. I've been like, I've been chewing on it all week. It's just deep. She says this, Our twisted inner logic, often unconscious, can convince us that we are too bad even for God to forgive. To hold God's mercy hostage to a determination to punish ourselves is truly a human sickness of spirit. See, there's something innate in, 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 the, in, in our humanity that when we do something bad, somebody needs to be punished. Somebody needs to be blamed. Have you known, have you known people like this? Maybe the man in the mirror? Are you, are you a blame shifter? Are you, you, it's, I have to put blame somewhere. Something has to be responsible. Something has to be punished. Something has to be held accountable for the way that I feel. And so what we often will do is we'll punish ourselves and we'll hold the mercy of God hostage because we think in punishing ourselves that that's, that's what makes us right with God. But can I remind you that Jesus took your guilt? That he paid for your guilt on the cross. Can I tell you the beauty of Christianity is that the God we're in relationship with is for us in Christ Jesus. He's not against you. He's for you. 
and he's taken your guilt. He took our guilt, church, and he's still taking it every single day, isn't he? Can I declare over some people, you have a new identity in Christ. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not only did Jesus take the guilt, number two today, number two today, he took the punishment. And if you think he's going fast because I'm already on number two, you're sadly mistaken because I have a lot to say. (laughs) He, He took the punishment. In Romans 6, Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He says this, the wages of sin is death. The only thing sin can pay is death. You can work for sin, but the only payout you'll receive is spiritual deadness, is a, is a cut off connection with God. That's what sin does. And we've seen our family members, we've seen our friends, we've seen even in our our own lives destroyed by sin. That one small decision can lead to another decision that leads to another decision. And eventually we end up in a place that we never intended to be. You remember that old saying? That sin will always, it'll always take you farther than you wanted to go. It'll cost you more than you wanted to pay. And it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. It will bring you to a circumstance that leaves you ashamed and broken with no hope, wondering, can God salvage my calling? Can God really salvage the things that I've done? Can God still really use my life? Oh, but see, Jesus took the punishment for your sins, church. And sometimes in church, if we're not careful, we can get really familiar with phrases and verses. Oh yeah, he took my punishment. Yeah, he forgave me. Yeah, he paid the price. What's for lunch? It's like sometimes we think that God just gave us a get out of jail free card. Hey, hey, buddy. Hey, come here, come here. Come here, buddy. Hey, it's okay. Imagine a buddy here. This is you. Come here, come here. It's okay. I'll just, I'll just take that from you and we'll just sweep it under the rug. Wink. It's all good. I'll take it away from you. But that's not what Jesus did, is it? See, can I say it like this? Jesus did not take punishment away from you. Jesus took punishment for you. He didn't take it away. He took it, he took it for you. Jesus, he took the punishment that you and I deserved. He took the shame and he took the guilt and he took the pain and he took the beating and he took the bleeding and he took the punishment. He didn't just circumvent the circumstances. No, he stepped into our broken world and he said, you don't have to pay the price. I will pay the price for you. This Isaiah 53 says, it says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He he was whipped so that we could be healed. He said, I'll take the punishment, son. I'll take the punishment, daughter. Just give it to me. I'll take your shame. I'll be nailed to a cross. I'll be tormented so that you can have peace. I'll take all the punishment on me so that you can walk in freedom. Is anybody thankful for the blood of Jesus today that says you can walk in freedom? I'll take it for you. I didn't take it away. I took it for you. I took it for you. See, church, God had to take judgment. Why? Because God can't change who he is. And he is just. This is so important that we understand this because this is what we believe. And this is what Paul writes to the Roman church. And really, it's written throughout all of Scripture that God is just and God is holy. And there is judgment for sin. He didn't just take it away. Someone had to pay the price. Oh, but someone paid the price. But I love it because it's hard to read Romans 2 without reading Romans 3. Romans 2 is it's like, it's like the problem, but Romans 3 is the solution. Listen to this, Romans 3, 25 through 26. Jesus' God-given destiny was to be the sacrifice to take away sins. And now he is our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. We come to him for mercy. For God has made a provision for us to be forgiven by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. This is the perfect demonstration of God's justice. Check this out. 
because until now, he had been so patient, holding back his justice out of tolerance for us. And so he covered over the sins of those who lived prior to Jesus' sacrifice. And when the season of tolerance came to an end, there was one possible way for God to give away his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy. You say, how can God be just if he forgives? Because God can do whatever he wants and will still be just, he'll still be just because he's God and you're not. And so out of his justice and mercy, he offered up his own son. And so now because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes. Church, someone had to pay the price. And so God lovingly sent His one and only Son to pay the price for you and I. And, and He did it so that sin could be defeated once and for all. And yet we still walk into spaces and places like this and wonder if God loves us. We still walk around day to day in our everyday life wondering if God is angry at us. Wondering if God still wants to use us. Wondering, does God even see me? Does God even hear me? Does God even care about me? Oh, but friend, I came to tell somebody today, he sees you, and he hears you, and he cares about you, and he's concerned about you, and he loves you, and he's there for you, and he's with you, and he's for you. Come on, somebody. He's, he sees you. He, he loves you. You can cast your cares on him because... He cares about you. And He's gone to the end. He's gone to the depths of sin and taken back the keys of death, hell, and the grave so that you could walk in freedom and so that you could live a life to the life abundant so that you can know He looks at you with love and light and compassion and He looks at you as, your, as His son and He looks at you as His daughter. Can I say this? May we never let the enemy harden and callous our heart to the message of the gospel. May we never get familiar with this story. May we never get familiar to the love of Jesus. The love of the Father. Stephen, we've heard all this a thousand times. Well, I think I need to remind you again. We need to rehearse. We need to remember. We need to recall what Jesus has done for us getting ahead of myself. I love Jesus because He didn't just take the punishment. He exchanged the punishment for purpose. See, He didn't just say, okay, I'll take the punishment, now go figure it out yourself. <laughs> no, no, He said, you're called. He said, he said, you're equipped. He said, I've ordained you. He said, I've called you. He said, I've anointed you. Come on, somebody. He, he, he looks at you and he says, I have equipped you. I have called you. I have ordained you. And I will sustain you every step of the way. I have a plan for your life. I've numbered the hairs on your head or the lack of hairs on your head. Come on, somebody. I know your every thought. I know you're coming and you're going. I know it all. I know the pain that's deep inside your heart. I know the doubts that are deep inside your mind. I know the things that you've walked through. I've seen it all. I've seen your past and I've seen your future and I choose to love you anyways. I choose to send my son anyways. We forget that God died for us knowing that some would reject him. Man, this is why I love serving at church. If you're looking for purpose, start serving. Can I just say that? If you're looking for purpose in life, start living life beyond yourself. Start giving your life away for the good of other people. I love how Bob Goff says it. He, he, says, he says, start loving people like you're made of the stuff. I love that. He's awesome. I love Bob Goff. Start loving people like you're made of the stuff. Because something that starts to happen on the inside of you when you start serving people you start, guess what, guess what? You start reflecting Jesus. You start looking like Jesus. Did you know the Bible says that it brings God glory when we reflect his nature? When we look like Jesus. Come on, Jesus, he didn't come to be served, he came to serve. I don't know, I just, I just felt that we get in community, we get in community together, and we, this is, oh man, I don't have time for this, Jesus. 
Our calling, listen, we don't, we don't have an individual calling. We have a community calling. Like, 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 like life is not about you. And, and this is the hard part is because because we don't know any better. We're, we're literally stuck in illusion and, and, and it's, it's a life of pride when, when I put myself first and it's all about me and it's me first. As long as I'm good, then it's good. No, no, no. That's the opposite way of Jesus. Jesus says the, the, the first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus, he, he came to serve as if to say we are to serve others. And that's where we find purpose. That's where we find, this is the power of community, friends. God has not just secured your, your eternity in heaven. No, he has allowed through community for you and me to be strengthened in, in the here and now. That we need each other. That we're better together. That we're stronger together. <laughs> it's not, if you just live life for yourself, I think you're going to end life empty. We have to, Start looking to the left and to the right and going, whoever God puts in my path, I'm going to love, I'm going to serve, I'm going to put before me. And I promise you, you something will happen on the inside of you. It might take a little while, but you'll, you'll begin to find purpose in God. Because here's the cool part is like everybody in this room, all, all across this room, we have specific purpose, right? Whether that whatever your job is, whatever your career is, maybe your specific purpose right now in this season, you're a mom, you're a dad, you're taking care of a, a, of a family member that's in need. You're, you're a student, you're a pastor, you're a coach, whatever it is, we have specific purpose. But did you know as children of God, we all have the same general purpose? What is our general purpose? Well, we could talk about uh, our purpose on earth is to give glory to God. Absolutely. But can I say like this? Our purpose in life as children of God is to love people. To reflect the nature of God is to love people. It's not a popular sermon nowadays. Love people. Like, oh, because love, love has become soft. But love is the strongest thing in the universe. Can I say, like, love is stronger than death. God's love is stronger than death. And the cool thing is, is if you're in Christ, if you're in Jesus, we've, ex we've been equipped because we've experienced God's love, so now we can let it flow through us to the people around us. But oftentimes... We get it confused, don't we? And just like we get it confused, Paul knew that the Roman church got it confused and he speaks to this in Romans chapter 2 because so often instead of choosing to love, we choose to judge. Can I pastor you this morning? I only got one yes, so I'm kind of scared. <laughs> can, can I challenge you this morning? If you said no, I'm sorry. This is... This is tough, what I'm about to read. And I want to make it really clear. There's not one person in this room that's exempt from this. Can I level the playing field? If I, if I wanted, I would like come down off the stage. We're all on the same playing field. We all judge. And this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 2. If you put it up there for me. There it is. You may think that you can condemn such people. And this is, hold up, hold up. This comes right after chapter one, and, and I loved what Pastor Jeff, the big smoke, little smoke, and how just because you sin differently than other people doesn't make you better than them. And Paul's now speaking to, to Jewish people who think they have a special relationship with God because they're like God's people, but, they're, but he, he's reminding them of something. And, and I think it speaks, I think it's relevant to us today as Christians. When we, when we think about people who don't believe, when we think about non-believers, even when we think about people who have gone astray, sometimes we can become kind of prideful. And this is what he says. He says, you may think that you can condemn, condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say that they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. Next slide. And we know that God in His justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do these same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant 
and patient God is with you, does this mean nothing to you? Can you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Another translation says that His kindness leads all men to repentance. Yeah, I don't, I don't have tolerance for sin. Oh, but God had tolerance for your sin. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't mess with those kind of people, you know. People who are different than me. Have you forgotten how kind God has been to you? Have you forgotten how, how patient God has been to you? Have you, forget, have you forgotten how, how tolerant God has been to you? Church, we need to be the ones who are reminded that we're the recipients of grace and mercy. Why would we give what we have not been given? Why would we judge when we've been given mercy? Maybe, there's a lot of reasons and this is another sermon for another time, but maybe because we've forgotten what we've been given. Or maybe I should say it like this, we've forgotten what we've been forgiven. We forget. There's a story in Luke chapter 7, and I don't have time to go into it very much, but Jesus gets invited to eat with Pharisees. Simon, the Pharisee, and they, he, he comes over, and my assumption is they order a pizza. And it's probably pineapple pizza because only Pharisees put pineapple on pizza. I'm kidding. Calm down. Stephen, you're dividing the church. Calm down. Like, like, God said you have to forgive me. So, and Jesus, he's, he's eating with these Pharisees. He's picking the pineapple off. And just for sake of time, a, a woman comes in and we know she's a woman of the street. She's, she's most likely a prostitute. Maybe even it's Mary. And she comes with a very expensive perfume, and we, we know that it would have this perfume was her livelihood. As a as a prostitute, you, you needed to smell good, and it, it was everything. It, it would have taken her, they, they say, a year's worth of wages to, to buy. And what does she do? Extravagant worship. She she breaks it and she she pours it out on Jesus' feet, and she's she's weeping and she's 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 washing his feet with her hair. I mean, a lot of times we're like, wow, so beautiful. It's like, it's kind of messy. I'm Jesus. I'm like, can you stop? No, but not Jesus. Jesus knows something's going on. And I love Jesus because the Pharisees begin to think things in their mind. And Jesus just reads their mind because it's Jesus. And they start judging her in their mind. And Jesus calls them out. And he says so many things I don't have time to get into. But, but I love this so much. He says in Luke 7, he says, I tell you, her sins... Her sins, and they are many. Can anybody testify? Come on. They are many, man. Listen, they've been forgiven, and so... Let me translate. Because her many sins have been forgiven, she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Church, why is our love small? Christians... In the country of America, why is our love small? Because we've forgotten how much we've been forgiven. Does that make you a bad Christian? Absolutely not. It makes you human. And God knows that we are creatures that tend to forget. This is why one of the most repeated commands in all the Bible is remember. This is one of the reasons we take communion, church. If you're wondering why do we got to do the juice and the cracker, can I remind you? It's to remember the price that Jesus paid for us so that when we get together, we can remember once again. We can rehearse and recall and retell the story of Jesus and we can get together and have our hearts melt once again in his presence and go, oh yeah, he forgave me of so much and you've forgiven me of even things I have yet to do. As something begins to happen to you on the inside, you start becoming a person of compassion. You start becoming a person of love. You start to become a person of mercy, not a person of pride, not a person of hatred. 
Jesus says, when you remember how much you've been forgiven, your love will be big. If we would remember and rehearse and rehash and retell the story, not just on a Sunday, not just once every three months, not, I'm talking in coffee shops, I'm talking in your home, I'm talking on the phone, talking about the love of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus, we would not choose to judge, we would choose to love. Can I say it like this? You don't follow Jesus and become a divisive person. You don't follow Jesus and start getting really gossipy and critical and judgmental and hateful. No, you start following Jesus, you start building bridges, not fences. You start getting people around your table that don't look like you, talk like you, act like you, vote like you, do smell like you. Some of us are going to be shocked when we get to heaven. We're going to be like, dang, you made it in here? Uh, How'd y'all get in here? I thought this was just for me and mine. I could say so many things, but sometimes the Holy Spirit tells me what not to say. And since I said that, I'll leave it up to your imagination. (laughs) Paul is saying, God has left you no excuse to judge. Friends, church, you and I, we're not the judge And we have Christians today who claim it's their right to judge. But Paul says, we have no excuse. Paul lets us know we have to let go of that mindset. You want to talk about dying to yourself? You know what, you know what Jesus is actually saying? Die to your selfishness. It's not, just, it's not just your sin. All those sin comes from selfishness. That's what Jesus is saying. Die to your selfishness. Die to that thing inside you. Can I tell you where this, this, this spirit does not come? It doesn't come from the spirit man. It comes from the flesh man. Go read Galatians 5. The Holy Spirit, He speaks to you. And He convicts you. And He leads you into all truth. But when it comes to other people's stories, friends, we're not their judge. And I, I, I think it's heartbreaking to God when the world is in need and all we want to do is add an excuse to why they're going through why they're going through. Yeah, they're, they're going through pain, but they deserve it. What? Have you forgotten what you deserve? You, you don't want what you deserve. You want to talk about what we deserve and what we don't deserve? I don't want what I deserve. I'm thankful for the mercy of God. I'm thankful for the grace of God. We're called to love, and then to love, and then to love. And if I had 50 more minutes, I'd say love 235 more times. And then to love, and then to love. And hear me, church, when it seems like it's not working, you're called to love. When it seems like things are impossible, you're called to love. When it seems like it's not working, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, Can I remind you, there's a power that's stronger than the darkness. It's the love of Jesus. And I love this new phrase that we're we're, we're kind of saying from Pastor Frank DiMazio, that we're bound to the book. You know what that means? It means I'm bound to love. I'm bound to forgiveness. I'm bound to reconciliation. I'm bound to putting other people in front of me. He took our, our guilt, church. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up so I can close. He took our, our punishment. And lastly today, Jesus took the power of sin. The one we're still not sure about. Jesus took the power of sin. Can I say this for anybody listening to my voice? And you have yet to commit your life to Jesus. You have yet to find relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you, the power of sin is so destructive in our lives. The power of sin leads to one place, complete brokenness. But the moment that we surrender our life to Jesus, the power of sin is broken once and for all. But if we're not careful, church, if we don't really seek the Word of God and the truth for ourselves, we can miss out on the fullness of relationship with Jesus. 
because it's not just one moment surrendering your life. It would be a great travesty for somebody to walk through those doors, hear, hear, hear about Jesus, surrender their life to Jesus, believe in Jesus, be born again, become a new creation, but then leave not knowing that there's so much more available to you. That there is purpose and there is power for you as you walk into your everyday ordinary life. That there's healing for the relationships in your life. That the power of sin can't stand any longer. Listen to me, we cannot stand here today knowing Jesus is Lord and Savior, but leave this place still believing that we're bound by the darkness. No, no, you've been set free. You've been set apart. The chains have been broken. Freedom is your testimony. You don't have to have the same story that your parents did. You don't have to have the same story that you had five years ago. The patterns can be broken. There is a new life and there is a new path. Can I tell you how good God is? Can I tell you how good Jesus is? He didn't just take the power of sin. He exchanged the power of sin with the power of the Spirit. You guys doing okay? Because that fires me up, man. Come on, God didn't just take the power of sin and then say, okay, now go figure it out. No, he exchanged the power of sin with the power of the Spirit. I'm not just talking about on a Sunday or at a men's camp or on a big, magnolia, a huge moment. I'm talking about for everyday life. I'm talking about when you have to have a difficult conversation with your spouse or with your child or, or a person that relationship has been fragmented. And listen, the Holy Spirit will lead you to forgive. He'll lead you to apologize. He'll lead you to speak destiny and purpose over your child. There's power available to you. You don't have to do it on your own. In our own, we can barely make it. But in the power of the Spirit, oh, we can do great things, church. Come on, God is able. God is able. God is able. And anything is possible because the power of the Spirit. You can walk into your job in the power of the Spirit. And you can be a light in darkness. You can be going about your everyday life and you can hear something in your head. You can get a prompting in your spirit. I need to reach out to that person. I know they're hurting. I know they need love. I know they need encouragement. Guess what that is? That's being led by the spirit. That's responding to the prompting of the spirit. That says, I don't walk alone. No, God is at work within me. Listen to Philippians 2.13. I love this. For God is working in you. Just in case you came to church and you weren't aware, God is at work within you. But I love this so much. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Oh, that's good news. Because <laughs> you, you thought this was up to you, but it's, it's actually not. Your job is to surrender. Your job is to place yourself in front of his grace. Your job is to keep your eyes on Jesus. And God's job is to sanctify. God's job is to set apart. God's job is to purify. Come on, God's job is to do all the heavy lifting. If you'll just position yourself in front of his grace and surrender, God will do all of the heavy lifting for you. It's not gonna happen overnight. No, it takes walking with him and talking with him and watching him and abiding in him and remaining in him and staying in him and resting in him. Oh, but God, he does the lifting on the inside of you, doesn't he? And he'll show you every day, there's more son, there's more daughter. Let me open up your eyes to the truth that, that my truth will set you free that my kindness will lead you to repentance, that my blood will lead you to healing and freedom, that it's been paid for, that you've been bought with a price, that I took the guilt and I took the punishment and I took the power of sin once and for all. And I wanna declare over some people, your testimony will be a testimony of freedom. Your testimony will be a testimony of love. It'll be a testimony of forgiveness. It'll be a testimony of power. It'll be a testimony of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. See, I don't care how many times, I don't care how many times you, you've heard about the price that Jesus has paid for you. Can I say, may we never get familiar with the good news. Can I say it like this? When we get familiar with the good news, the good news stops being good news, it becomes mediocre news. And for far too many Christians, the good news has become mediocre news. And as a result, our love is small. Oh, but I want to be like Paul. I want to be like Paul, man, who says, 
who, who, says, who says, I'm not an expert. I'm not here to impress you with elegant speech or lofty wisdom. You're like, wow, this guy's really simple. I am simple because I want to be like Paul. I'm, I want to be consumed with one topic, Jesus, the crucified Messiah. Come on, Jesus, the crucified Messiah. That That's all I need, Jesus, the crucified Messiah. Because when I step into his place, when I step in and he makes that exchange, come on, everything changes. Jesus changes everything. And it's not mediocre news. It's the greatest news on the planet. That he took what you deserved and you got what he deserved. That he who knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And it doesn't stop there. He fills you with the Spirit. He fills you with the Spirit. Will you stand to your feet as we close today? Come on, I want want to say this as I close. Freedom comes when we realize that Jesus is the prize. That Jesus is the promise. That Jesus is the treasure. Can I say this? As you wait for miracles, as you wait for breakthrough, as you wait for the job, as you wait for the spouse, as you wait for the opportunity to come, can we, can we know that God is enough? That God meets us in the valley? That God satisfies our soul? That God heals our broken heart? That Listen to me, listen to me. It's, it's faith though. Faith is the catalyst for your freedom. Faith is the catalyst for your freedom. God is pleased. God is blessed. God is honored when we can't see it, but we decide to believe it anyways. Come on, God is looking for some men and some women who will say, God, I can't see it, but I hear you. I know you're working in my life. I know you're not done with me. Can we lift our hands all over this place? Come on. I know I got a purpose. I know you got a plan for my life. I know you're writing my story, so I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to surrender to you. And God, we just thank you. We thank you so much today. I want to declare this over every person in this room. Come on. Guilt is gone. Punishment is gone. The power of sin has been broken because of the blood of Jesus. Can we give God a big shout of praise in this place? We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come on, let me pray over you. Let me pray over you. I know I offended some of you and I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you right now, you'd make our hearts soft. Ah, we're not the Lord of our life. Jesus, if you're Lord, then our, our, our declaration needs to be whatever you say goes, God. Why? Is it just because we're, we're nothing? No, it's because we trust you. It's because, God, you've proven yourself time and time again to be good, to be faithful, to lead us to a land flowing with milk and honey. God, we, we, we've seen you, we've tasted of you, and you are good. And we trust you. And I just pray for every heart in this room. God, I pray for guilt to go. God, I pray for anybody that's holding your mercy hostage this morning, that you would just release them right now. Come on, Jesus says, I paid for it. I paid for it. Give it to me. Give it to me. I bought it. I bought you at a price. You don't have to walk with that guilt any longer. You can walk in freedom today. God, would you open up our hearts right now to to, to the realization, to the awareness. God, there's a gift in front of us right now. We accept it. We step into freedom from guilt. God, I thank you so much. Anybody in this room that feels like they've just been beating themselves up. God, we, we, we go through life every day and we say, I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm such a screw up. But God, I pray that you would wipe that clean right now. Holy Spirit, just speak to minds right now. Speak to spirits right now. Speak to souls right now. God, speak to hearts right now. You're my beloved. You're my masterpiece. I chose you. I called you. You're mine. I bought you with a price. You're my son. You're my daughter. God, we pray for that spirit to leave right now in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you that you broke the power of sin. For anybody in this room that feels like they're in a pattern, feels like they're in a cycle, God, feels like they can't break the power of sin, I thank you, God, I come with a testimony today that you have broken the power of sin once and for all, and you can break it right now in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for what you do. We thank you for what you do, Jesus. And God, I pray as we leave this place, oh, you would infect our heart with your love God as we lay our head on our pillow tonight would we just we can't get it out of our mind how kind you've been how good you've been how patient you've been how tolerant you've been how loving you've been God and we would just continue to rehearse and recall and retell the story of your goodness Jesus